In the past number of weeks, as I have said to you, we have considered the five Levitical offerings that God gave to his people Israel. We have sought to give some idea of what the Israelite worshiper had to do and how that reflects the gospel even to this present day. Strangely, in the verses that we're looking at today, there appears to be a, a re restating of the same offerings as if God is repeating himself. And yet they're mentioned again for a very specific reason. There is a distinction. And if I was to read this with you, if I was to have read it before we began to preach, you would have thought, well, he's just saying everything. Is he going to preach all the same sermons he's already preached to us? Well, well no, we're not going to do that. There is overlap. But there is a distinction as well, and perhaps the easiest way to classify this distinction is to consider that what we have looked at up until now is instruction to the worshipper, and how Moses was given word that was to be passed on to the worshipper how they are to come before God. Whereas today, what we are looking at, though it revolves around the same activity, it is instruction for the priests to guide them in their responsibilities in carrying out these sacrifices. The distinction is brought out by the term, this is the law. And we'll find it first in verse 9 of chapter 6, where it says, command Aaron and his son, saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. Then if you look at verse 14, it says, uh, again, this is the law of the meat offering. And then verse 25 it says, speak unto Aaron his son, saying, this is the law of the sin offering, chapter 7, verse 1. Likewise, this is the law of the trespass offering. And verse 11 of chapter 7, this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offering. So there are the five offerings we've already looked at. But on this occasion, when they're mentioned, it is uh, prefaced with this term, this is the law of. And that is telling us something about the instruction necessary in order to uh, lead in the worship of these offerings. The word law is, in the Hebrew, a familiar word to many, I'm sure, the word Torah. And it's used over 200 times in the Old Testament scriptures. Sometimes it refers to the books of Moses, the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. Sometimes it refers to the entirety of scripture. Often you'll find that in, in like the Psalms and various other places, and even you'll find it referred to really just certain rules and regulations as we have here, the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings and so on. So it's being very specific in what it is referring to. But it is giving here clarity in how the minister of God, the, the priest, uh, would, would, would conduct himself before the worshiper and how he would uh, lead in these offerings so that the people understood the intention of them and the message of them. My desire today is to just draw out certain truths uh, that the priest had to reflect on what he did that is a message to the people, communicating to them the gospel. And just as a point of information before we carry on, uh, there, there seems to be, if you go to the end of chapter 7, and you read verse 37 of Leviticus 7, this is the law of the burnt offering, of the meat offering, and of the sin offering, and of the trespass offering, and of the consecrations, and of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, which the Lord commanded Moses in Mount Sinai in the day that he commanded the children of Israel to offer their oblations unto the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. Now that's interesting because... If you have been here over these past weeks and you have a good memory and you listen well, you'll remember that what I said at the beginning of Leviticus is this message is coming out of the tabernacle. God is communicating Leviticus out of the tabernacle. But here we are told that the law to the priests was given while they were still in Sinai. And the question is why? Well, I believe that very simply the Lord was instructing Moses and in giving that law so that the priest would know what to do. But in the bringing of it together, he begins with the worshiper and what the worshiper must do in the worship of God. And then he brings this in at the end. Uh, the priests, no doubt, were familiar with all these things already. And then they are just put in here again as a reminder, as something they can turn to and for coming generations. But he, he kind of puts it together by the Spirit of God after the instruction to the Israelite worshiper. I have titled this message, The Priest's Service in the Law of the Offerings. The Priest's Service 
in the law of the offerings. And I trust the Lord will bless us as we look at the five major points being the five offerings that are here contained. So firstly, the service of the burnt offering. Let's read the verses together and then we'll break it down. Chapter 6, verse 8 through 13. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments, and put on other garments, and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall, ne shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. This is the service of the burnt offering. This is the law that was given to the priest concerning this particular offering to the Lord and how he was to officiate. And as I've said to you, I just want to draw out certain gospel truths. I don't want to deal with it verse by verse and phrase by phrase, but things that were to be conveyed by the priest to the people. Firstly, he must convey the purity of Christ. In verses 10 and 11, you'll see that there are garments mentioned that they are to wear these linen garments that they were to adorn themselves with. And linen is a symbol of purity. Speaking of the church in Revelation 19 verse 8, it says there, and to her, that's to the church, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So the glory of the church, the beauty of the church is their righteousness. And that righteousness is an imputed righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is depicted here in garment form as being the material linen and being white and clean. And this is what the priests were to reflect, this purity as they came before God and ordered the, the people and led in the worship in this particular offerings, in these particular offerings, wearing white linen. Speaking of the Levitical priests in Ezekiel 44, 18, it says, they shall not gird themselves with anything that causeth sweat. So they weren't to put on garments that would cause them to sweat. Linen was the lightest material they had. It was something that enabled them to conduct their affairs with, with, with minimal uh, feeling of the weight of it and the sweat that would be caused by it, such as woolen garments and so on, that would most likely cause you to sweat. And there's a reason for that, isn't there? Because when we think of sweat, our minds go back to the curse and what the Lord promised because of the fall, that he would sweat, that man would sweat, and the sweat of his brow, he would eat bread. That all reflected, while it's not sinful to sweat, don't get me wrong there, it's right to sweat, it's right to work hard and, and produce the sweat, but it reflects a fallen world. It reflects a world of the curse, where it's hard to cause the earth to bring forth produce and so on, where we have to sweat in order to provide for the needs of our families. So sweat reflects the curse, and that's the point. The priests aren't to reflect the curse. They're to reflect purity because they're standing in the room of Christ. So that's seen in their garments there in verses 10 and 11, linen garments that they're to put on. But not only the purity of Christ, they're also to convey the humiliation of Christ. Again, we used that last week. We use it carefully again this week, meaning it in the theological sense. Christ humbled himself when he became man. The high priest had very elaborate garments from whenever he was in the holy place and in the most holy place. It tells us all about those garments in Exodus chapter 28. and verse 2, it's summarized by this. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And so whenever they were in the holy place or the most holy place, or rather in the most holy place, they had to take it all off as well. But in the holy place anyway, they had these, these garments that they were allowed to wear that reflected uh, the glory and beauty. But 
When you look at this offering, there is no place for the glorious garments, all the pretty garments, the, 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 the very elaborate garments that were made for the priest, the high priest. They were just to wear a linen garment. But note also that the linen garments were, 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 were specific about what they're to be on as well, because it says his linen breeches there in verse 10. Now that's a very interesting, we might wonder, well, what, what's the linen breeches and what's the point in that? When you read uh, what it says there in verse 10, his linen breeches shall be put on his flesh and then take up the ashes and so on. Well, if you read about it, if you turn back to Exodus 28, maybe just to see this, about these, about the linen breeches and so on, it might give some light here and we'll, we'll elaborate on it. But in Exodus 28, verse 42, verse 42, Thou shalt make them, that's the priests, linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. Now it's very serious. Is. If he came in without these linen breeches, there the warning was death. He'll bear iniquity and die. And, and so we, we ask this question, what is being reflected here in these linen breeches and what is covered? Well, very simply, without, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be very careful with their language, but simply it, it, calls, it, it covered the, the, the male member that, that we get procreation from, if I can use language like that without being too explicit. That's what it covered. And you say, well, well what was the point in that? Why was it so important that that was covered? And the reason why that must be covered, men and women, is because it's from that member that corruption stems to all humanity. You remember back in the garden, I can't take time to go back to it, but whenever Adam sinned and fell, immediately they covered their nakedness. And that's what it's reflecting. The nakedness of their, their body parts. That they became aware of who they were in that sense. And they felt this need to cover them. And they covered them with fig leaves. And the Lord then he comes and covers them properly with something that required the shedding of blood. But the point is this, they were aware of that. Why did they become self-conscious? Because there was like this inherent knowledge that from this the curse will be passed to all posterity. All the children that would now be born would be born in sin and shapen in iniquity. As Paul puts in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die. This becomes a member of death to the entire human existence. So it has to be covered. It had to be covered up in order that the man, the priest, could approach God and not be burned up. Because that was reflecting the fall and the corruption of man's sin. It was important then, as we think about that, to be covered. And I can just for a few seconds make application about the fact that nakedness is a very serious matter in the mind of God. It doesn't seem to be serious nowadays, of course. People run around parading their nakedness. And all that does is reflect the shamelessness of their ungodliness. Our society's delight in nakedness today reflects its inability to discern spiritual ugliness and to grasp their fallen state before a holy God. It's not the will of God that we run around naked. It's not the will of God that we ever promote nakedness among people. It's not the mind of God. And any true believer will be aware of it, I am sure. And whenever it's not being practiced, then it is a lack of understanding. One of the curses that Jesus Christ had to bear upon the cross was the nakedness of the cross. The shame of that, as he was made sin for us who knew no sin. But the point here of these priests and their garments, men and women, is that the linen reflects humility. It's not glory. It's not the wonderful garments of the high priest. It's just linen. And when he put on the, 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 the elaborate garments, if you like, it was in a certain context of being in the holy place. And that is showing to you, men and women, where in the holy place it is heaven itself. And Christ in heaven had all of his glory, but then when he came out to offer himself upon the altar, as these priests are doing, offering the sacrifice on the altar, it's in humiliation. It's not in glory. 
And that's what this is showing. So the priest is to convey this. And of course, verse 11 tells us that he needed fresh linen garments. If you look at verse 11, if he, he shall put off his garments and put on other garments to carry forth the ashes because the idea is when you're offering this sacrifice, it would probably get unclean, messy, and we'd have to have fresh garments to change again to reflect the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ in their action and in their deeds. He must also convey the sufferings of Christ. This is perhaps the greatest emphasis that is here in the law of the burnt offering, the sufferings of Christ. You look at verses 9 and 12 and 13. We'll just take a moment. You'll see a, a repetition of things. This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. Verses 12 and 13. The fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Conveying the sufferings of Christ, what do we mean? The fact that the fire was never allowed to go out. Never. At all. It wasn't allowed ever to go out at all times. Whenever they, I don't know, all that they did in order to keep it burning through the night, but whatever they had to do to sufficiently keep the fire burning, that was the lot of the priest. That was what he was to do. And we say, well, what was he conveying? What was the message there that God was getting across through that means? And I put it to you as conveying the sufferings of Christ. How so? The priest could never let the fire go out in order that men would see that the eternal sufferings for sin will never, ever go out. Ever. The fact that the punishment for sin is a fiery punishment is something no one wants to hear, certainly not these days, but it is a reality. And while we may turn away from this doctrine by nature, we don't want to hear the doctrine of eternal punishment, the fact that God consumes sin by fiery indignation and judgment, Yet it is clearly in the Word of God. It tells us that it would never go out. It shall never go out. And if there's any particular characteristic of hell that men don't like, it's the everlastingness of it. And yet this is what the Word of God teaches. I think we should look, take time to look at some verses together, or at least let me read some verses to you that reflect the message of the New Testament on the reality of hell. Matthew 10, 28, I'll read to you. The Lord Jesus speaks there. And what does he say? Fear not them which kill the body. People may threaten to kill your body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. People say hell's not literal. Well, is your body literal? And do we believe the soul to be literal? Jesus is not speaking hypothetically here. He is saying, as your body is literal, as your soul is literal, so there is a hell for those who do not know Christ. Mark chapter 9. Jesus uses very strong language here. Mark 9 verse 43. We'll take time to read these verses because it's very repetitive in its message. Mark 9 verse 43 and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed and having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. You say, is he telling me to cut off my hand? Not necessarily, of course it's not. But he is using the extreme to show that if your hand is the reason why you're going to hell, better cut it off. Better without it. Makes sense. Especially if it's literal. How does this make any sense if it's not literal? Jesus is saying, if any member of your body, if any part of your being is the reason that God must damn you forever, cut it off. Because it's better to be without that and go into life. He continues, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, Verse 45, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. 
And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. I think the Lord is very plain. But it's amazing how men will twist this to lose its direct application. The fact that there's a literal hell. And it's all envisaged, all very clearly portrayed in this burnt offering. The fire shall never go out. And the priest was conveying that. Whenever an Israelite was raising his children, warning them that God is a God that ought to be feared and yet loved. And if we don't love him and keep his commandments and trust in him, then the inevitable will be the case. Some look at that smoke as it ascends from that altar. It never goes out. It never goes out. And you'll be the one burning if you do not have a substitute. Men and women, this is serious. If you're here this morning and you do not get the reality of hell and you're still living in sin thinking that you can trifle with eternity, I want you to wake up. It is not my great joy to preach on eternal punishment, but I must preach the word of God as I find it. And here in these verses, as I've shown to verse 9, 11, and 12, or rather 12 and 13, it is showing this continuity of the burning. The fire can't go out because it reflects something. It reflects the indignation of God against sin. And men will suffer. It is our desire that you will not because it is also conveying the sufferings of Christ that all of that that's burning would finally one day when you would look up and there's no more fire ascending to heaven. There's no more smoke going up. There is no more smoke, men and women. That's the joy. There is no more smoke ascending up into the heavens. There is nothing we look at that's symbolizing that anymore because we're meant instead to look to the cross. The fire was quenched forever. Jesus, for those who trust in him, endured that fire of God's wrath to set us free from what we rightly deserve. That flame that the priest kept burning was a symbol of the justice of God. It's eternal and unquenchable. God punishes sin. And that shows us the sleeplessness of hell. It will never go away. Verse 10 also talks about the ashes, to put them beside the altar. And we might ask, well, what's that about? These ashes were left in a visible place, a reminder of the judgment of God. The ashes were a reminder. Someone come along and they would see the ashes and see that this fire has been burning and burning and burning. And they would see those ashes and the ashes would be a reminder of the judgment of God. And I want to prove that to you by reminding you of a couple of passages in the New Testament. First, in 2 Peter chapter 2. And here, Peter is warning that God will judge the false prophet. He will. And he will judge them seriously and severely. And he will punish sin. And he talks about, in verse 4, if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to reserve for judgment, then verse 5, spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Then note verse 6, another historical example, the angels, the flood. Then another event that occurred in Genesis 19, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. The ashes of Sodom and Gomorrah were a reminder of the judgment of God upon them for their sin. It's also brought out by Jude as well. Flip over to Jude. In verse 7, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah as well. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Suffering. Yes. That's present continuous. That's carrying on. 
The idea is that even now, Sodom and Gomorrah are under this judgment. That is, the fire that came down and consumed the cities was only symbolic of the place that they were going to. They remain an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The fires on the plain were not eternal. They were temporary to consume the city. But Sodom and Gomorrah are ever a reminder for what God does to sin. He will not turn a blind eye to it, men and women. He will not overlook your sin. You will suffer hell if you do not have Christ. And if you were an Israelite and you were looking at the burnt offering, then the priest would be conveying to you by this continual offering, this continual sacri- or, or continual fire that's going on there, putting wood on it to make sure it never goes out. He'd be saying to you, beware. He must also convey the death of Christ. I'll be brief for this. It talks about the ashes back there and the burnt offering. It mentions them. And Christ is the ashes because the ashes reflect death. And they reflect the death of Jesus Christ. But note where they're carried to. It tells us that they're carried to a clean place, verse 11. Carried without the camp onto a clean place. And this is a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what happened when he died? Was he left there to be buried along with all the malefactors? No. Joseph of Arimathea came along and John 19 records this and verse 41 says that he put him in his sepulcher, a new sepulcher wherein was never man yet laid. Isn't that a wonderful picture there of what the Lord is reflecting would be the case concerning his son? That when he would die, yes, those ashes would reflect his death, but those ashes would be carried into a clean place not into a corrupted grave where other bodies were, but a a place where no body ever had laid before so that while he died with the malefactors, he would not be left with the malefactor. He would have a death or rather a burial that showed his own purity. So that's then the service of the burnt offering. The rest of them should be a little bit shorter, I trust. Secondly, the service of the meat offering. Let's read the verses together. Verses 14 through 23. The meat offering. This is the law of the meat offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord, before the altar, and he shall take of it his handful of the flour of the meat offering, and of the oil thereof, and all the frankincense which is upon the meat offering, and shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savour, even the memorial of it unto the Lord. And the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat. With unleavened bread shall it be eaten in the holy place. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation they shall eat it. It shall not be bacon with leaven. I have given it unto them for their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy, as is a sin offering and as the trespass offering. All the meals among the children of Aaron shall eat of it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Everyone that toucheth them shall be holy. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is the offering of Aaron and of the sons, which they shall offer unto the Lord in the day which, is, which he is anointed. This is the, uh, uh, a particular part of this offering that is for those who were ordained in the priesthood. The tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a meat offering perpetual, half of it in the morning and half thereof at night. In a pan it shall be made with oil, and when it is bacon, thou shalt bring it in, and the bacon pieces of the meat offering shalt thou offer for a sweet savour unto the Lord. And the priest of his sons that is anointed in his stead shall offer it. It is a statute forever unto the Lord. It shall be wholly burnt. For every meat offering for the priest shall be wholly burnt. It shall not be eaten. So here we have the meat offering. And I'm not going to go over all the ingredients, the flour, the frankincense, the oil. We dealt with that all in the past. And if you weren't here, then you can look it up on the internet or on the website and and get those sermons. But there are a couple of things we want to see what's being conveyed here by the priests and what's going on. First, he must convey the surrender of the Christian. Verses 14 through 18 show the meat offering by the people, by the Israelite, what he is to do in bringing the grain offering, the flour, the bread, whatever it is, depending on his uh, position of life and how much money he had. But the main point of this is that it's an unleavened life. That's the main point. There's no leaven here. It's to be unleavened, no leaven. In other words, the Christian is to present his life voluntarily to the Lord and present it as God gives him grace without leaven, without sin. That's his aim. That's his desire. 
We are not to think, though we'll get to the fact that we're still battling with sin, and there'll be something that reflects that in just a moment, but we're not to get to the point where we think that, think that it's fine to come and offer ourselves contaminated with our sins. To think that it's just normal to have sin just to become accustomed to it. Well, I do this sin, I fornicate and I blaspheme and I lost and I whatever. I, I, I worship other gods and I have other things that are more important to me than the Lord. But I don't think God really, matter, really cares about that. It doesn't really matter as long as I've prayed a prayer. The point is this here. You come with your life unleavened. You seek to root out all leaven. And so it was for the priest as well. He is to convey full surrender, the full surrender of Christ. Not really the individual bringing it, but the full surrender of Christ himself. Because if you read verses 19 through 23, this is the ordained people and their offering of the meat offering. It tells us that unlike the normal meat offering, in which only part was burned, and then there was the memorial part. Um, the offering of the priest was burned entirely, showing the voluntary, consecrated life of Christ as a priest for the cause of his people. There's no holding back of the flour, no holding back of the bread. Again, this, if you're here for the first time, you may be unfamiliar with this, but if you're here for the meat offering, you'll, you'll, it'll all come back to your mind. There's no holding back. You're allowed that you brought your flour, whatever, and there was some that was thrown on the fire, the rest was kept for the priest. But whenever the priest was offering his own meat offering, he was to reflect not himself, but the full consecration of Christ. And that meant all of it on the altar, the whole thing. Nothing held back whatsoever. The whole point of this meat offering is to reflect the holy life that is handed over to God. It's first reflected in Christ and then required by the people. And we are to live that way, men and women. We are not to hold back. If your desire is to be used by God, and I hope that is the case. Lord, use me. If you can use me, use me. I hope that's your prayer. I hope you want to be used. I hope it isn't that someone here is a Christian, but you never want to be useful to God. I'm going to tell you what is necessary in order to be useful to God. It's simply this. You bring your all. You bring your all. Now, you may look at yourself and say, well, I'm not very much. I can't preach. I can't teach. I can't do this, that, or the other. My circumstances of life have changed. I'm older now. I'm very limited in what I can do in contributing to the kingdom of God. But listen to me. You think of that boy who came to the Lord. Whenever the thousands were gathered, the 5,000, the multitudes that were there, no doubt way more than 5,000, they're all there. And they're all hungry. And he's standing there. I mean... What are five loaves and two fish going to do? Nothing. Not even going to feed the disciples. But he comes forward with the little that he has. He just brings up those five loaves, the two fish. It's not much, but I'll give it to God. I'll give it to the Lord. Let Christ have it. That's all I have. There you are, Lord. And what happened? A miracle. A miracle of multiplication, a miracle of creation, a miracle evidencing the very person of Christ as God manifest in flesh. Wonderful. One of the most wonderful miracles in the entire ministry of Christ recorded by all four Gospels. And so we see that. Men and women, that is a call to every one of you to stop limiting God and thinking to yourself that you have nothing to contribute. Just bring what you are. Come to God and say, here is my life, Lord. I don't know what you can do with it. I have no idea in what capacity I could possibly be of use to God. But here I am. No reservation. No hesitation. No holding back. Here I am, Lord. And we sing it plenty of times in this house. Lots of hymns about sacrifice, about giving ourselves. But I wonder how much of it comes from the heart. Look, you will never prove what God is able to do through you until you're all on the altar, until you are fully devoted, until you bring yourself as much as lies within you to him. And that's the need. That is the need of this day. It's the need of this house. It's the need of the church all the time. It is that people would get a hold. It's not about me trying to figure out what I can do for God. 
but what God can do through me. Let him deal with the details. Let him lead in the way. Let him sort that out. But you give yourself to him. My son, give me thine heart. That's it. Give me yourself. That's what the meat offering reflected and what the priest was guiding the people to see. The surrender of the Christian life. The full surrender of Christ in his life and how we are to bring what we can to him and let him iron out the details of what way we might most glorify him. Then the service of the sin offering, verses 24 through 30. Verse 24, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest that offereth it for sin shall eat it, in the holy place shall it be eaten in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled in the holy place. But the earthen vessel wherein it is sodden shall be broken. And if it be sodden in a brazen pot, it shall be both scoured and rinsed in water. All the meals among the priests shall eat thereof, it is most holy. And no sin offering, whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation, to reconcile with all in the holy place, shall be eaten. It shall be burnt in fire. Something here before we get into what it's conveying. There may appear to be a contradiction here in verses 26 and verse 30. If you look at verse 26, it tells us that the regular sin offering was to be eaten and tells us where it's to be eaten. And then in verse 30, it tells us that it's not to be eaten, <laughs> but it should be all be burnt. And you say, well, is there a contradiction there? No. Verse 26 is dealing with the regular sin offerings. Verse 30 is the holy place offerings where they are burnt. If you remember the sin offerings, there were certain the priests and the rulers, they had to bring a bullock and that blood would be carried into the holy place. For the regular people and so on, they didn't have to bring a bullock. They only had to burn what, was, what they brought to the altar. They didn't go into the holy place. So it's just making a, 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 a distinction here. When it goes into the holy place, it can't be eaten. When it's outside, it can be eaten. That's simply, it's not a contradiction uh, here at all. But what's it conveying? What is this conveying? What's it saying to us as we deal with this sin offering? What's the priest to show to the people? First, he must convey the blood as the answer for sin. He must convey the blood as the answer for sin. Look at verse 27. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash that whereon it was sprinkled in the holy place. So he's focusing on the blood, the effect of the blood. And you read down through these verses, you'll see that in the sin offering. But the effect of the blood, what it does, whatever the offering touched would be made holy. If the blood touches anything, it doesn't stay the same. It doesn't remain as it was. If the blood touches it, it doesn't stay the same. And if it got anything, if it, if it was any of the blood that got on anything it shouldn't be on, then it must be washed immediately because it had to reflect this fact. The blood would never be shed for something that it wasn't intended to be shed for. That's a wonderful application of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That Jesus died for his people. Jesus did not shed his blood randomly to be just thrown about the world and just see where it lands. He shed his blood for his people. The blood here could not be splattered or allowed to remain on anything it wasn't intended to be on. It wasn't intended to be on the garment, whatever. It wasn't meant to be because it was specific in its use and its application of the worshiper who was coming. And when Jesus shed his blood, to the same degree it might be said he was shedding it for his people. And some call it limited atonement. Some call it lots of different terms. But the fact is simply this. When Jesus died on the cross, it was not for the possibility of salvation, but for the guarantee of the salvation for those for whom he died. He was guaranteeing it. He was assuring the fact that they would be saved. But there is a tremendous power, therefore, in the blood. Whatever it touches, it does something. It, it changes it. And I wonder, do you believe that? Do you believe in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ? We quoted it already today. 1 John 1, verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. 
Nothing else removes sin. Nothing. No amount of penance, no amount of praying, no amount of anything. It is only the blood that the Bible says removes sin. It is when I see the blood I pass over and there's no judgment. Exodus 12. It is the blood that shall make atonement for the soul. We'll get to that in Leviticus. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses all sin. It is the blood, men and women. The blood had to be shed. The old Baptist preacher of the 19th century, C.H. Spurgeon, said this. By this blood, sin is cancelled. By Jesus' agonies, justice is satisfied. By his death, the law is honoured. And by that precious blood in all its mediatorial efficacy and in all its cleansing power, Christ fulfills all that he stipulated to do on the behalf of his people towards God. O oh, believer, look to the blood of Christ. End quote. Look to the blood. So this is what the priest is conveying here in the sin offering, that the blood is the answer for sin. It's the blood that cleanses. Who whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy. That's a wonderful image of what happens when you trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, oh, listen to me. It's just one application of the blood and you're cleansed. You're holy. You're made right before God. One application of the blood. Just trust in the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse away your sin. doesn't matter what that sin is. doesn't matter how long you've been living in that sin. It will all be removed. Tremendous. What an image. But he must convey the body as the vessel for God. Not only the blood as the answer for sin, but the body as a, as a vessel for God. In verse 28, it makes mention of the earthen vessel. And throughout Scripture, the earthen vessel symbolizes the human frame. Many Scriptures point this out. I'll take for one example, Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. We are like pottery, and you, you'll see this idea of pottery and, and, and of clay and so on, and how we are that. And of course, it reflects what we are made by. We are made from the dust of the ground, and so we are vessels. And here we see the earthen vessel uh, being used in this particular aspect, and then it has to be broken. After it's used, it must be broken. It cannot be carried on. Different ways of looking at this, but I, I think it, it conveys the fact that the body is a vessel for God. This vessel had one use. That's it. Once it was used in this sacrifice, you couldn't use it for anything else. You couldn't clean it. You couldn't scrub it. You just had to break it. It had to be broken. That's what it says. Shall be broken. And the concept of it is this, that this vessel simply has one use. It's been made, it's never been used before, it's brought before for this purpose. Once it fulfills that purpose, it's gone. That's it. It has no other purpose. And that, men and women, is showing again the fact that we are vessels to God. If we claim to be Christian, if we claim that He is King of our lives, and the Lord is all that matters to me, He is my chiefest concern, and there upon that cross He died for my sin, and I want to give myself to Him. Well, that kind of language reflects the fact that you're saying there's no room for anything else. Nothing else. My vessel will be used for one thing. Glory to God. That's it. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Of course, there's many ways we do that. Some do it in a state of marriage. Some do it in a state of singleness. Some do it in old age, young age, whatever. We're all in different circumstances. Some do it by working, some by keeping the home. But the point is this, a vessel that has one purpose, bringing glory to God. That's it. I wonder, are you such a vessel to God? That you are giving yourself entirely to Him. And when your time is up, that it is you're broken. And that body is left in the ground to set aside. You have no other purpose. No other purpose. I preach in the 21st century. I wonder what it must have been like to preach in the first century. I mean, all these people who seem to get it. They're all just totally given over to the Lord. There was no holding back. Whatever the need was, they were there. Whatever they could do, they would do it. 
There was such a hunger in those early days after Pentecost where they met every day to have the word opened and to break bread and to share and pray and, 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 and so on. Just constantly, constantly given over to the things of God. I no doubt they had their work, they had their employment, they had things that they had to do, but they were given to this. They were sold out for Christ. Now, now what, is it, what does it even look like to be sold out for Christ? What does that look like? Do you know many Christians sold out for Christ? Do you know anyone living who can actually say that person is completely sold out for God? They are few and far between. Few and far between. But this is what the earthen vessel reflects, I think. It has one purpose, and that's it. May the Lord help us. Fourthly then, the service of the trespass offering. We come into chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Let's read them together. Likewise, this is the law of the trespass offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, shall they kill the trespass offering, and the blood thereof shall he sprinkle round about upon the altar. And he shall offer of it all the fat thereof, the rump, and the fat that covereth the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the caul that is above the liver, with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn, upon, burn them upon the altar for an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a trespass offering. Every meal among the priests shall eat thereof. It shall be eaten in the holy place. It is most holy. As the sin offering is, so is the trespass offering. There is one law for them. The priest that maketh atonement therewith shall have it. And the priest that offereth any man's burnt offering, even the priest shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he hath offered. And all the meat offering that is bacon in the oven, and all that is dressed in the frying pan, and in the pan shall the priests that offer it, shall be the priests that offereth it. And every meat offering mingled with oil and dry shall all the sons of Aaron have one as much as another. So this is a trespass offering. Again, I don't want to go through everything we've already dealt with, but again, just reflect what the priest was to convey. First, he must convey the appointed place of death. We could have brought this out in the last one, but we bring it out here. Verse 2. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, shall they kill the trespass offering. In the same place, the worshipper was instructed. The priest would tell him, there, that's the place where you kill it. That's the place. And he would direct him there. He would point him there. He would say to him, there's where you kill it. And the worshipper would bring that animal, the goat, the lamb the bullock, whatever it is, and he would slaughter it there in that specific place. And he would point to that place and say, there is where you must kill it. And that is just like the minister in many senses, in many ways, where it's the same idea. He must point sinners to the same place day after day. It wouldn't matter what day you came, the priest would say, there, there. What about over here? No, there. And if, if, you, if there was a queue, if you had to just wait, there was a specific place where you killed it. No moving. There's only one place. One place where death occurred. Just like there's one place where the preacher points sinners to. It is the cross. Only one place. The pointed place of death, the cross, that we all must be directed to all the time. Never move away from a believer. Never move away from the cross. Stand in the shadow of it every day. It is my duty and ever pray that God will give me more grace to bring you to sit in the cross, to sit in the shadow of it, to behold it, to understand it, to view it, to love it, to worship right there at its foot. So he must convey the appointed place of death. There's one place for death, only one. Just like the cross, the only place where Jesus must die. He must convey the continuity of Christ's righteousness. The continuity of Christ's righteousness. Look at verse 8. And the priest that offereth any man's burnt offering, even the priest shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering which he hath offered. It's a wonderful picture of the gospel. The skin of the animal was given to the priest that was involved in the offering. And while it had a practical value, and it did, he was able to take that and he could have used it, making clothing for himself, covering of his habitation, uh, sell it. Uh, they would have made lots of use for the, the skin of the animals, as is even to this day. 
But it wasn't just the practical application or the practical use that the priest had of it. It was depicting something. It was conveying something to the worshiper that the righteousness of their substitute would carry its value beyond death. Now you get that. The righteousness of the substitute would carry value beyond death. Remember what they had to do. They had to find a creature without blemish and bring that to be killed. Then it would be killed. But the skin would remain. And the skin would remain as a reminder of the continuity of the value of the, of, of the, the, value of the animal. The righteousness of the animal, we might say. Just as is the case with Christ. Men and women, it's not just the cross, you see, that we needed. We needed the life of Jesus Christ for our salvation. We needed him to live for us. He lived out the law on our behalf. That law we fail to fulfill every day. He lived it out perfectly. Every day he was obeying the will of the Father. He was living out the commandments every single day. I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And then he dies on the cross. Does his righteousness die with him? No, never. And I ask you this morning, how did Jesus enter into heaven? How come he, as man, yet God, how did he enter into heaven? Was it on the merit of his deity? That's what some might say. He went to heaven. Of course he went to heaven. That's where he came from. He is God. That is not how he entered into heaven. He entered into heaven. He had become man. Therefore, the only basis upon entering into heaven that he had was his own merit, his own righteous life. He was accepted into heaven on the basis that he fulfilled the coven of works broken by the first Adam. And he went in there because he had a right. You might say he had a double right. He had a right by reason of his deity, but he also had right by reason of his obedience. And he went in there. His righteousness did not die on the cross. And that's what's reflected here. The animal dies on the offering there, on that altar. It, it dies, but the skin remains as a reflection of righteousness, of the need of man. And Christ carried his righteousness beyond into heaven and gives it to all who believe on him. His righteousness it clothes us and gives us a right into heaven as well. That's the basis upon which we go into heaven. <laughs> Not upon the inherent value in the deity of Christ, but in the inherent value of of the obedience of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is how I am seen today. <laughs> Love that hymn. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress. Midst flaming worlds, in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Why do I lift up my, my head with joy? Why can I look at God in the face and not fear? Because Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are. The beauty of the sinner who trusts in Christ is twofold. The blood cleanses the sin. His righteousness is given to him. The righteousness of Christ. So we're glorious. Indeed, we are as Christ is. As he is, so are we in this world, First John reveals. As he is. As he presently is in his perfection. The perfection of his humanity. So are we. Perfect. This is what it is to be saved this is what it is to be a Christian and have access to God and become the sons of God, adopted into the family of God, have entered in before the presence of God to pray with boldness, it is to have cleansing from sin and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Oh, wouldn't it be good even as Christians if we saw each other in that light more and more? We have a terrible habit of only seeing each other in the light of our own folly, sinful righteousness so-called righteousness. We might say unrighteousness. That's all we see each other as. You see your, you know, my sin, I see your sin, and we might think highly or more lowly of each other, and I know there's a place for having you know, respect to those who live a holy life and people who walk after the manner of the gospel and, and seeking to follow them, as Paul says. But at the same time, sometimes we're terribly harsh on fallen believers, terribly harsh. And we see their folly, we see their sin, but we don't see them as Christ sees them. He'll have no trouble 
It's even the fallen of his people to welcome them into glory with no hesitation. <laughs> Come thou, inherit the kingdom, enter the joy of the Lord. Fifthly and finally, the service of the peace offering. Let's read from verse 11. We'll end at verse 21. Leviticus 7, verse 11. And this is the law of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, of peace offerings, which he shall offer unto the Lord. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, and unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil of fine flour fried. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. And of it he shall offer one out of the whole oblation for an heave offering, that's a wave offering, unto the Lord. And it shall be the priests that sprinkleth the blood of peace of the peace offerings. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, it shall be eaten the same day that he offereth, offereth his sacrifice. And on the morrow also the remainder of it shall be eaten. But the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt with fire. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be eaten at all on the third day, it shall not be accepted, neither shall it be imputed unto him that offereth it. It shall be an abomination, and the soul that eateth of it shall bear his iniquity. And the flesh that toucheth any unclean thing shall not be eaten, it shall be burnt with fire. And as for the flesh, all that be clean shall eat thereof." But the soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from, from, cut off from his people. Moreover, the soul that shall touch any unclean thing as the uncleanness of man or any unclean beast or any abomin abominable unclean thing and eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings which pertain unto the Lord, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Right. The peace offering, the last here. You'll find frequent references to thanksgiving because that's what's reflecting. Joy, thanksgiving, appreciation. It's not offered by anyone seeking mercy, but only by those who have obtained mercy and peace through God, uh, through Christ, with God, through Christ. And so it's, it's the last. It comes at the very end here. Before it came in the middle, now it comes at the end because it was the least frequent one to be offered. But what does it convey? What are we here presented with as it conveying to us. First, the priest, as he conducted his affairs in ministering in the peace offering uh, before the worshiper, he must convey the problem of remaining sin. Verses 12 and 13. Note what happens here. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes. Then there's unleavened wafers. Look at verse 13. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. Why? What is going on here? Why is there that which is unleavened and then that which is leavened? Again, mostly in Scripture, the vast majority of references to leaven are negative. It reflects the effect of sin. Leaven, yeast that is, that gets in there and it spreads, it permeates through all that it is in and it impacts all that it is in. The idea here is that the unleavened wafers are showing that which doesn't have that permeating ill effect of leaven. But then there is the leavened bread, verse 13. Why? And I think, men and women, what it's conveying is the remaining issue of sin still in this life. And no matter what we offer to God, there still is sin in our hearts. It shows that we're still battling. And beloved, do not think that in this life you will ever be perfect. Lament your sin, yes. Grieve over it, yes. Confess it, yes. But never imagine or come under the illusion that one day here in this life you will be without it. <laughs> I want you to look down the annals of time before you, all your life spread before you if God spares you beyond this day and into the future. And you look down, I want you to see it's a life of grieving over sin and glorying in the cross. That's what it is before you. I just want to unveil the future for you. 
That's what it will be. If you're a Christian walking with God, this is what it is for the rest of your days here on earth, grieving over sin and glorying in the cross. And if it's ever different, you're off the beaten track. Something's gone wrong. <laughs> that is the life of the believer. He must convey the resurrection of Christ. How does he do this in this? On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up to preach, he quotes the psalmist David, and he refers to the fact that his soul would not see corruption. He wouldn't, the Lord wouldn't allow him to see corruption. He wouldn't go to hell nor see corruption. And he quotes then, or he says in, in verses 31 and 32 of Acts 2, he seeing this before, that's David seeing this before, as I'm speaking prophetically, speak of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up. So Peter, as he stands there, begins to make connections between what he's just observed and what he has read in the scripture. Hmm. David talked about this. We've just witnessed it, the resurrection of Christ. He didn't stay in the grave. He didn't suffer, experience corruption. David talked about that. And then he gets up and he preaches it and he points to Christ. Now, Christ did not stay in the grave longer than the appointed time because he was not allowed to see corruption. He wasn't permitted to see corruption. His body must be kept without corruption. Thus, in order to reflect the lack of corruption in Christ and his resurrection, the priest instructed the worshiper to eat the remaining peace offering before it corrupted. That's what verses 15 through 18 are dealing with. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time. But it's dealing with that. Eat it. First day, some of them could go to the second day. But on the third day, no eating. No, because it would be corrupt. It would not be fit for eating. It would show, it would reflect corruption. And since it is of the offering that points to Christ who didn't suffer corruption, then you can't eat it because you're misapplying, you're misreflecting the gospel. So you must eat it before it sees corruption. So he must convey the problem of remaining sin. He must convey the resurrection of Christ. He must convey the need for cleansing before fellowship. Verses 20 and 21. The soul that eateth of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. In verse 21, similar. If he has his uncleanness, he'll be cut off if he tries to participate in the peace offering. Why? If a man try to participate in the peace offering... Which, which signifies reconciliation, remember, as we dealt with this before. If he tried to do that before he's cleansed, <laughs> he would be cut off from fellowship. He has no right to be there. The peace offerings could never be the first offering. Never. Wasn't allowed. It always had to follow sin offering, trespass offering, burnt offering, meat offering often as well. Then it comes at the very end. It is a picture of the peace that we have in Jesus Christ. The fact we can sit in communion with God. We sit around the communion table reflecting that there is no more enmity between us and God. He calls us to sit with him and eat with him. And that's a standing only for those who are justified. It's for those who have had their uncleanness removed. They've been through the burnt offering. They've been through the sin offering. They've been through that which reflects the need to deal with their sin. Then they can participate in the peace offering. If you get it the wrong way around, you're cut off. And that's a warning. That is a warning to those who think that you can be part of the church and participate in church life, take communion, be baptized, present and portray yourself as a Christian, but you've never been saved. You have no right. You have no communion. You have no grounds to reflect that you have peace with God when you don't. And that is why when we read 1 Corinthians 11, when those who come to the Lord's table and taking it in a way that they ought not to be taking it, no doubt part of that being a problem in their hearts as well as the manner in which they were going about it, 
For this reason, there's many sick and many sleep among you. God judges them. It's reflected here. You'll be cut off. You have no right. There must be cleansing before fellowship. There must be. So, as we close, we have looked at the, the law of all these five offerings, sought to go over them all with you here so that we don't have to go through them individually in the uh, weeks that lie ahead. But what we see is that the priests had a tremendous duty to convey all these truths to the worshiper. He had to convey them. He had to reflect them accurately and instruct them in the right way and all that he was doing himself and instructing them to do. And he was a man set apart for that purpose. Set. These Levites did not have another job. This was their job. They had this to do, instruct the people, lead the people, convey the gospel to the people. That's it. They were to be like the Lord Jesus, the great high priest, who in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 19 says, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Sanctify yourself, Lord? What do you mean by that? You don't have to be sanctified. You're perfectly holy. But the language of sanctify also means set apart. Set apart. For them, I am set apart. Here is the Lord of glory, men and women. Oh, wake up and pay attention. The Lord of glory condescends to separate himself unto the needs of worms like you and me. Sinners who are at enmity with him. Those who break his law and think lightly of him. Who are constantly failing and failing miserably in trying to in any way reflect our duty before him. But what does he say? I sanctify, I set myself apart for their sakes. That they also might be sanctified through the truth. Set apart through the truth. And so this is what the Levites were to do. They were set apart we were not allowed to work, we weren't allowed to farm, we weren't allowed to be part of anything that the normal Levite or uh, Israelite were a part of. They were set apart for that office. And the whole purpose wasn't for themselves, it was for the people. They set apart themselves for them that they might be sanctified through the truth that was conveyed by their ministry. And so it is in the New Testament. So it is to this day. The New Testament pastor is called to be the same, to set apart himself so that he would reflect truth that sets you apart onto God. That is a calling. That is a calling. And I am called to be set apart, to help you be set apart through the truth. And this is why we do this. This is why we present this. This is why we teach the scripture. It's why we come regularly, you know, three times on the Lord's Day and so on. We all come and we gather Tuesday night, Ladies' meetings, men's meetings, young people's meetings, other occasions we come. And the word is always central. The word is always at the heart. Why? Why? Why don't we just have buns and cakes and sit around and laugh and chuckle with each other? Why don't we just go and just turn everything into a social affair? And the men will go out and play golf and call that an, an outreach of the church. And the women will come and do crochet and call that an outreach of the church. Look, all those things are fine. They might even have a place. But listen to me. The purpose of the church, the pillar and ground of truth, is that the man that's set apart is set apart to set you apart through truth. That's it. The Levite was called to that calling. The pastor is called to that calling. The Son of God lived out that calling. And so collectively, I say to you, as Paul said to those at Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, having therefore these promises, what promises? All those gospel promises we've looked at. Everything that is depicted in all these offerings. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us, yes, you and me, Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting holiness. There's one thing that Leviticus conveys. It's holiness. The need for it. And Jesus had that cry that we would be 
sanctified, set apart through the truth. Be holy, for I am holy. May the Lord help us. May even today someone just like that little boy who threw his five loaves and two fish was the instrument and provided the needs for multitudes. May someone even today say, Lord, I don't have much, but here I am. <laughs> Whatever you can do with this, have it. May the Lord give you grace. Let's pray. Let's bow together in prayer.